Uh, welcome to Kairos's Climate Action Dialogue, Building Momentum for a Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. My name is Beth Lormer, and I'm the Ecological Justice Program Coordinator at Kairos Canada, and I will be the moderator of tonight's event. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us today for this conversation. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathering today on the traditional territories of Indigenous people across Turtle Island. We pay respect to the traditional guardians of the land upon we, which we live, work, and play. I acknowledge that I am joining you today from un, the traditional unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples here um, on the banks of the Kichisibi, um, also known as the Great River or the Ottawa River in, uh, in Ottawa. We acknowledge that Indigenous peoples are the traditional guardians of Turtle Island on the land also known as Canada. We recognize their long-standing and ongoing relationship with this territory, which includes unceded and traditional land, and acknowledge our duty to walk with and alongside reconciliation and decolonization efforts. Reconciliation is an ongoing process requiring unlearning colonial practices and history alongside relearning our shared past, present, and future. At this time, I invite you to take a moment to place your feet on the ground as you are able and take a moment to acknowledge the territory where you are joining us from today. Thank you. And welcome to people who may have just joined. Uh, we are just giving a land acknowledgement um, and taking a moment to acknowledge the land that we're joining from today. I encourage you to keep introducing yourselves uh, to one another in the chat uh, and just some other housekeeping notes. Um, please keep yourself muted uh, uh, during tonight's um, speaking uh, portions of the of the event um, and of course uh, when it's time to ask questions or when we're in our small group discussions um, you can unmute and um, go and speak um, but uh, just keep yourself muted to respect our, our speakers. Um, this event will be recorded and um, we are recording it um, as you will have heard the notice. Um, we won't be recording or sharing the, rec the small group discussion in breakout rooms um, but uh, but we will be sharing out the speaking portion of tonight's event. Uh, so do look for that. Uh, and um, yeah, I think I, I will just provide a bit of overview before we get started with our speakers. Um, so yeah, tonight's Climate Action Dialogue is part of Cairo's Climate Action Week, which runs from September 11th to 17th. Um, and uh, the focus this week is on um, the, the main uh, the main cause of, of the climate crisis, which is fossil fuels. The burning of fossil fuels uh, accounts for almost 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions and a rapid transition away from fossil fuel extraction and use is critical for limiting global warming. Um, we know this, yet major climate agreements like the Paris Agreement and outcomes from um, uh, COP, uh, COP27 and other uh, conferences do not even mention the term fossil fuels. And since uh, uh, COP21 in Paris in 2015, where global leaders agreed to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, global fossil fuel consumption has continued to rise. Many countries that signed the Paris Agreement, such as Canada, continue to approve new fossil fuel projects worldwide, even though we know that the burning uh, of the world's fossil fuel reserves um, that are, we have already access to will result in seven times more emissions than what is compatible with keeping warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we need a treaty to end the expansion of fossil fuels and accelerate a transition to clean energy. And that is why the focus of this week's Climate Action Week is on that very subject. Um, and this event uh, and other calls uh, from the global climate strike are, are calling just for that. So the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative is a global effort to foster international cooperation to accelerate this transition to clean energy for everyone. And our first speaker is going to, to share more details about the treaty initiative shortly. But I just wanted to add that um, Kairos Canada has endorsed the treaty initiative um, back in November of 2020 and is part of a growing movement of faith-based voices that are calling for uh, 
fossil fuel phase out. The World Council of Churches formally endorsed the treaty initiative in June of this year. Um, and uh, also in, in June, uh, the Secretary General of the Anglican Communion signed uh, the treaty following a resolution that was made at the Anglican Consultative Council in February of 2023. And these annou announcements just build on other faith leader and communities that have been endorsing the initiative over the last couple of years. There have also been a significant number of youth voices and youth led organizations that have endorsed the treaty initiative. And in this week leading up to the global climate strike, we want to hear from them and amplify their demands for fossil fuel phase out. So we are going to hear from two young people um, today, but first uh, we will have an overview of uh, the treaty initiative. So I would like to now present our first speaker, uh, Claudia uh, Campero Arena, who is the Partnerships Coordinator with the Fossil Fuel and Non-Proliferation Treaty Network. Based in Mexico City, Claudia um, has worked collectively, collectively with NGOs and grassroots organizations, environmental justice issues since 2005. She worked with the Council of Canadians, Food and Water Watch, and Greenpeace Mexico. And she is a member of the Alianza Mexicana Contra el Fracking. So welcome, Claudia. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll pass it over to you. Gracias. Hola. How are you all? Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm happy to join the conversation. And um, thank you so much for all the support that uh, Kairos has been uh, signaling towards the treaty. And thank you so much for, for organizing this event. Let me know if my connection is okay. It's been failing me today. So if you feel that it's dodgy, let me know so I switch off my video. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Hopefully this will work for me. It does. Okay, so what's this initiative about? We like to call it a bold global policy demand uh, to really change the what we have right now towards a fossil fuel free future. And while we know that uh, um, climate action failure is a very high risk and a very high uh, threat to everybody globally. And um, I'm guessing you've been seeing and feeling it from wherever you're joining, how things are changing very quickly. We had the terrible heat wave that affected uh, uh, most of, of North America. Uh, and now we can see the terrible flooding happening around the world, and uh, this is definitely getting worse. Um, we know that we have a gap, and we call it a production gap. It basically means that what is already being extracted in the coal mines, in the oil uh, wells and gas wells is 110 more than what can be produced if we want in a scenario of survival. So um, this mm -hmm. means we have to change. We have existing projects that go beyond what we call the carbon budget. So the carbon budget that allows us a likelihood of 50% to stay in a 1.5%, 1.5, sorry, uh, degrees centigrade uh, is already above. So this is not the new project. This is only what's being produced currently, okay? Um, um, and we also know that even when we share that there are more renewables happening, fossil fuels are, are still being used. That hasn't changed. There has been some increase in renewables, but fossil fuels are still being extracted, still being burned. And they represent 
uh, the majority of the energy that we use around the world. So what's, what are we facing right now? If we don't have an agreement on fossil fuel production, we're risking and we're making harder the transition. Transition is something that we must have. It's inevitable. But if we keep extracting fossil fuels, uh, it will only make it harder. It creates what we call stranded assets and financial uh, turmoil. What does that mean? It means that uh, there will be infrastructure being built that we cannot use because uh, we're uh, really uh, increasing the temperature so much that there's a, a point where we have to stop. But the investment on this uh, uh, infrastructure would have prevented other kinds of investment, for instance, in renewable energy or in schools or in hospitals, right? So we're using money in a wrong way. Uh, if we don't have this agreement, we risk workers, we risk communities, uh, it delays renewable energy expansion, it delays economic diversification, right? The fact that many countries depend on the extraction of fossil fuels for their economy. Uh, it consolidates the powerful pro-fossil fuel political constituencies. I think <laughs> in North America, we know how much they can actually get away with these powerful interests of, of, of um, fossil fuel industry. Uh, it increases the risk of technical, economical, legal, and political lock-in, where it's much more difficult to have change. It increases the risks of dangerous geoengineering, these non-proved ideas of how we can manipulate the climate, which are nonsense. Uh, and it risks, of course, warming well beyond 1.5 uh, centigrades. Uh, we know that, for instance, the International Energy Agency tells us Antonio Guterres, who is the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, has said investing in new fossil fuels infrastructure is moral and economic madness. This is very clearly stating that this is completely unreasonable, right? So the Paris Agreement doesn't even mention fossil fuels. The Paris Agreement uh, has all this conversation on reducing emissions. And it's a way that we delay the hard conversation that we need to wean ourselves out of fossil fuels, okay? So this is something that has been lagging in the international agreements towards uh, changing the, the current status. And there's also a very important thing that we need to know. This problem is terribly unjust. The countries that are not able to transition are going to have a very difficult time. But there are countries that have the capacity to transition and they actually have the responsibility of uh, having done emissions for longer and need to support the transition in other parts of the world. So that's why in the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, we talk about three pillars. We need a just transition. So we need to help countries to move their economies away from fossil fuels. We need non-proliferation. We need to stop making this crisis worse stop expanding. We know that we cannot have a future with fossil fuels. Why? Why are we still opening new coal mines and new oil and gas wells around the world? And we need a fair face out, which is what I was saying about production. Already what's in production today takes us away for the future that we need. So we need to phase out the existing fossil fuel production to limit the warming below 1.5 with wealthy nations moving first 
and fastest. So what are the strategies that we engage in, to, in order to make this happen? Well, we aim to catalyze international cooperation to make this treaty possible. We aim to build concentrated power to decrease the social license that the fossil fuel industry still has to operate around the world. We need to build public support with regional partners to make sure that we can have this phase out that we urgently need. And we need to scale compelling storytelling and communications to amplify this demand. So we are a truly global initiative. Uh, our steering committee members are from around the world and the organizations that have joined and endorsed the treaty are from uh, around 117 countries. <coughs> Pardon me. We have partners from around the world uh, that uh, are actively promoting um, the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. And we have many um, uh, endorsers that, such as Kairos today, are supporting our work through, you know, a specific uh, moment and invitations that we are very grateful for in order for us to spread the word elsewhere. Uh, today, we have more than 2,000 civil society organizations endorsing, more than 3,000 scientists, uh, more than, than 600 uh, parliamentarians from around the world, 101 Nobel laureates, more than 90 cities and some national governments, and more than 2,000 youth activists and leaders promoting the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. We now have been publicly supported by five na nation states. These are five nation states of the Pacific, and these are countries that have traditionally led the discussion internationally for uh, stopping or doing something about what is happening with our uh, global warming. Uh, so we're really very health, grateful to these nations for all the commitment and the support that they have shown uh well these are some um pictures of moments where we have uh, managed to get good impact in press um one of those moments was when we got the support of noble laureates of course we also have the support of many uh, faith institutions uh right now we're nearly uh 400 faith institutions that have signed the faith that you can find in our website. I'll copy and paste the link um, after I speak. And uh, we are proud to say that this comes from many different faiths from the world, but here we're um, uh, showing how in particular we had a very big moment when a Vatican Cardinal uh, called also for the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Um, in the health uh, atmosphere, in the health uh, constituency, we have uh, support of the WHO, uh, which has been very significant and very important in a call for the non-proliferation treaty. And uh, yeah, more nearly 400 also, um, health institutions, communities of doctors, nurses from around the world, making this an, the argument of our health as central to the need to uh, phase out fossil fuels. The European Parliament has also supported this call, uh, asking nation states uh, to join and work towards this proposal. And many cities from around the world have also joined the call and uh, sent uh, themselves the call for their national governments to join this proposal. Youth activists have been really supportive, uh, very vocal 
in uh, speaking towards need of the fossil fuel treaty and we are also grateful for their leadership um, as I've mentioned, uh, more than uh, 600 parliamentarians from 84 countries led by uh, countries from the south have uh, uh, been supporting the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. And just recently, this is fresh out of the oven, the state of California has formally endorsed uh, the proposal of a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. And this happened uh through a resolution uh brought by senator gonzalez and uh it went through the senate and through, uh the house in order to be uh recognized so what can you do so to support in words uh but also help us promote uh the fossil fuel initiative through whatever means are uh, in your possibilities. Uh, there are many uh, materials in our social networks and such that are going to uh, be of interest of you. We also have lots of research done. And uh, I have a very particular invitation right now that we are preparing a uh, a webinar on the safeguarding the Amazon. This is going to happen next Tuesday, and I'm hoping you want to join. We're going to have speakers, uh, indigenous leaders from different countries in the Amazon region, but also government representatives. And this uh, live stream is going to happen in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So you can join and listen in, in English if if you don't know the other languages, um, but this is a quite exciting moment and uh, we are definitely supporting all the activities that are going to happen um, in in New York next week around the, the climate week. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claudia, um, for that really informative overview of the treaty initiative. Um, and uh, we will be sharing some of those links uh, that Claudia mentioned. Um, if she shares them now, that's fine, but I, I have a list of a few that I'll share at the end of, of tonight's gathering. Um, so I'll, I'll just open it up uh, for questions from, from Claudia before we continue, if there's anything that you want to ask of, of her. Ah, yes, Anne, just unmute yourself, yep. Uh, Claudia went so quickly that it was hard to get this. I mean, there was a lot of material and I think it could have taken twice as long for <laughs> us to get it all and make notes and take it all in. Would it would it help, Claudia, are you able to share the, the slide deck that you that you just showed us or? or... That would help. I'll I'll set it that way and I can share for sure. Great. Okay. Then we will make sure that that gets circulated to all the, the folks that registered. Um, yeah, there but, is a but lot if of there's there is something a lot of thing that requires more detail. I'm happy to try to address. Um, I do have a question here from the chat. Are there any countries on the cusp of signing the treaty? That you're aware of in addition to this to the, the five or six the block from the pacific my my vocabulary fails me a cusp is like nearly signed. that's fair <laughs> so um almost <laughs> almost ready to sign on are there any um, countries yeah as as you may know this is um not an easy task for governments from around the world. They have to commit to these three pillars in uh, making sure we have the just transition, stopping expansion, and stop, uh, you know, m having the plan for the phase out. So these are three things that are not easy tasks. So the fossil fuel treaty does is not 
drafted yet. The government needs to draft it. And we are working actively with some uh, committed government to join the leadership that these specific countries already have in um, calling for the commitment to draft the treaty and then um, bring other countries on board. So um, I can share that we are, for instance, working and have had a very good response with the Colombia government. Uh, we currently have a government in Colombia that has already committed to stop expansion and is actively talking about what the just transition looks like. So um, that's already in their discourse and they recently joined BOGA, which is also an initiative uh, towards stopping the 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 production of fossil fuels. So this is um, something that is still in the works. Um, we are hoping that other countries in other places of the world might join, but um, this is, of course, something that takes time, that requires a lot of negotiation within the country. And um, I cannot say, um, that all things are ready for that to happen in other places of the world, but we definitely have many other leads that we're working on. Great, thanks, Claudia. Um, I have another question um, about concern. What are some of the current geoengineering proposals that may be of concern? And Carla, I don't know if you're able to come on and just uh, maybe provide a bit more context about your question. Yeah, but I mentioned oh. that in my presentation, so maybe that's yeah. why. Yeah. If, if the question's clear to you, Claudia, you can you can just respond, but I just wondered if yeah. uh, Carla wanted to add anything. Okay. So, uh, yeah, geoengineering uh, actually blows my mind, and I <laughs> have to say that it's not an, a speciality of mine, so I cannot, you know, talk into a lot of detail. But for instance, uh, some of the proposals of geoengineering are around, okay, we know that when volcanoes erupt, they block some sunlight. So the uh, particular matter that goes into the atmosphere might do some cooling effect. So why don't we bombard the atmosphere and just make it as a huge, uh, uh volcanic eruption around the world right what could go wrong these are the sort of things that people that don't want to change the dependence that we right now have on fossil fuels are proposing like just just let new pollutants <laughs> come into the air and let's forget about the agricultural consequences that that might bring and the fact that we don't know all the ecological factors that come uh, together and the toxicity and such so these are the sort of ideas that geoengineering take and also why don't we fill the ocean with um nutrients for photosynthesis to come about. And so these are the sort of things that uh, Jerry Engineer does. And the other big thing that happens is the idea of carbon capture and storage, which is very, very limited, the experimentation that has happened. And it's not clear that it could be scaled up and whether that is truly one solution it's really very expensive and it basically just shows the unwillingness to change in something that we already know that doesn't only harm the climate but also harms all the people that are around the cycle the extraction the processing the burning we know that um, air pollution kills people around the world, millions of people around the world. We just have Clean Air Day a couple of 
of days ago, and we know that we need a more healthy future for 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 our children. So why are we just hanging on <laughs> to this toxics? Um, because we're we're not willing to change. I think the future um, uh, must be better for us if we commit to this change. And so these are just a few examples of 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 the distractions to stop the action toward phasing out fossil fuels. Great. Thank you so much, Claudia. That was um, that was a really thorough response. Um, uh, we have we'll just uh, maybe one last question um, that we can take from Claudia, and then we're going to um, move along in the programming uh, to our next two speakers. Um, but just a question uh, quickly about being asked to support the formation of a treaty. So I, mean, I don't know if that's something that I can um, answer just briefly from from where I sit in kind of organizing this um, event tonight. But uh, you know there. The, the endorsing organizations are, are being asked, you know, we are we are endorsing a treaty initiative. So an initiative for nation states to come together and form a treaty. Um, and that's what uh, the endorsement means um, kind of from from where from my perspective. Um, and uh, so uh, all of us here as individuals are, are called to support the treaty initiative. Um, as individuals, and if we are members of organizations to do that too, and then to call on our elected officials and representatives to also um, kind of throw their weight behind that initiative. I don't know if, uh, Claudia, you'd like to ask, to add anything to that, um, but just... She's sharing the presentation, which is great. <laughs> I must say that uh, it's very inspiring how things, how people come to an initiative with ideas and souls towards supporting this. And uh, many of the cities that have uh, joined this initiative have done so because there's been a group of uh, concerned citizens that have gone to their representatives and told them about it and insisted and, you know, engaged in meetings and such. Uh, there, There's an African artist, Ina Maria, she's so lovely. She uh, has done a beautiful banner of the non-proliferation treaty with uh, sewing. It's kind of patchwork, I would say. Uh, I'll, I'll, share, I'll share a picture with you right now. Uh, youth activists have just come around with us and just taken away the banner and take it towards, you know, uh, mobilizations within different moments. And uh, just recently I received, uh, you know, uh, an op-ed from a Mexican academic. She heard about the treaty and she wrote her op-ed about it and she hadn't even started contacting us. So it's really about where you are and what would you like to do and if if you feel this is a good idea and you want to invite others uh please do this is this is a campaign that has um been successful precisely thanks to this creativity and this generosity of people from different uh parts of the world Thank you so much, Claudia. And I see a few more questions have come in and we will have a chance to um, maybe bring those discussions into our small groups um, uh, following our next speakers. So just hold on to those and uh, hopefully we can have some some discussion that will help answer them or kind of advance the conversation. Uh, I just want to thank Claudia again. I know she's going to have to leave at the top of the hour. So um, she may just uh, disappear on us, um, but I'm just grateful for her presence here today and uh, for sharing the presentation. So thank you. Um, we are now going to uh, move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, who is Tia Kennedy. Uh, Tia is an Indigenous rights activist and youth leader in her community. She carries Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe teachings from Oneida Nation uh, of the Thames and Walpole Island First Nation. Uh, she is the founder of uh, Canoe Quay Consulting, a company that empowers organizations to address discrimination and develop the necessary skills, knowledge, attitudes, and values to promote meaningful and effective interactions with Indigenous peoples. Uh, Tia um, is a rising girl fellow from 2021. 
Uh, she has spoken at the Global Women's Forum in Paris, uh, the Right Here, Right Now Global Climate Summit, and one is, was one of the youth delegates of the Kairos for the Love of Creation delegation to COP27 in Egypt last November. Uh, she currently supports Indigenous youth with cultural leadership programming at Indigenous Sport and Wellness Ontario. And uh, we're so grateful to have you with us tonight, Tia, and I'll pass it over to you. Hi, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, and it was really great hearing the previous presenter. I'm looking forward to the next speaker as well. Um, yeah, so I come from two communities. Um, I mostly follow my Anishinaabe side. Those are my uh, my matrilineal side that I follow. Um, and for the Anishinaabe people, we have a really close relationship with the water. Um, so I think that's where a lot of my water uh, activism comes from. Uh, we're known as the people of the Great Lakes and we've used the waterways as our highways for centuries. Um, my Anishinaabe community, Watpool Island First Nation, it's uh, surrounded by water and um, unfortunately the lake that we're surrounded by, it's just downstream from Chemical Valley. And so that's located in Sarnia, Ontario. And um, that's where 80% of Canada's petrochemical industry operates 24 seven. And they're still legally allowed to pollute in our waters today. Um, this is a serious impact that we face in our communities um, of environmental racism. Uh, it infringes on our, you know, our sustenance, our, our food and, you know, the fish that we consume, the plants that we use as medicine. Um, even though my community, Watpool, does have a water treatment facility, meaning that, you know, the water that comes from the taps is being treated. Um, our animal and plant relatives uh, don't get that same, that same fortune. Um, you know, those, and we still consume them. And so we're still being impacted um, by industry and extractive industries. My other community, Oneida Nation of Attempts, uh, were, we were on a boil water advisory at the beginning of this year for about three or four months. I think we're off it now, but it comes off and on. Um, we're located by uh, the Thames River, Deshkin Zibing, um, and we're just about 20, 25 minutes outside of London, Ontario. And that's um, who actually does a lot of the dumping of sewage within our waterways. And so again, you know, the fish and the plants, they're all very impacted. And um, I also volunteer and work at a land-based camp uh, within my community of Oneida Nation of the Thames. And so we, um, we've been monitoring the climate um, a lot more closely because we're helping the community do research, environmental research. And the impacts of climate change, um, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty serious. I mean, um, our hunting season, we're, we're behind on it because of the weather's changing. Um, you know, this summer was so hot that we could hardly do any um, trapping and um, even just going outside to try and take the youth to get medicines. It, it's so extremely hot that, you know, it becomes really difficult for them to stay outside that long. Um, and unfortunately, you know, that close river that would be really great to cool off in is being impacted by sewage. Um, so we can't even cool off in our waterways and our water systems. Um, and these are really um, uh, effects of climate change that we're experiencing firsthand within our communities. As um, Indigenous First Nations communities, um, you know, we're seeing it in front of our eyes. Um, I think most Canadians are too, but for us, um, I, I feel like because we're so closely connected to the environment and we have that relationship, um, even while I'm out, I, you know, noticing the trees. Um, so the trees are some of my helpers as um, uh, spiritual helpers. And um, so I, I notice them and how they're being knocked down from the high winds. And so a lot of people don't understand that even though we're not experiencing tornadoes, we're still 
experiencing high strong winds that are impacting our environment and impacting our trees, um, which impacts us and our oxygen and the way that we can breathe. Um, some of my work, I did a, a documentary on um, how my family was directly impacted by the water crisis. And, um, you know, on my grandma and her three sisters, they all passed away very young uh, from cancer. And so under the ages of 60, starting at the ages of 30, they all passed away from cancer that was caused by environmental factors and the dumping of our water. And this comes from, you know, petrochemical industries, these extractive industries. And when you live on reservations, um, the way that the land is kind of split up, it's like each family has their own area. And so on our street, there's probably about 15 people in our family that have had cancer. And it's all related um, to the water and the dumping that's happening. Um, so when it comes to this treaties and us moving away from fossil fuels, I am very much for, um, for it, for the treaty and moving away from fossil fuels. I, wa I worked for the um, Indigenous Services Canada for a little bit um, in the governance branch. And while I was working there, there was an elder that told me, um, you know, you really have to be careful uh, with the government because um, there's a lot of trickery that goes on. And so as Indigenous peoples, it's kind of been ingrained in us um, to critique the government and not always have trust in them, unfortunately. And I think um, Canadians are starting to more so realize that, you know, we have so much power as individuals and um, as communities to create the change that we want to see in the world. And so it's really up to us to move away from, um, you know, fossil fuels on, a, on an independent level as well. And so not only pushing our governments and our, our cities to move forward and signing these treaties, but also thinking at how what we can do at an individual level uh, and not supporting uh, companies like RBC and um, who are huge investors in fossil fuels. And um, actually the fossil fuel industry, it has a direct linkage to the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls genocide that's happening where indigenous women are 10 times um, murdered at the rate as uh, regular Canadians, uh, females. And so they noticed in areas where there's tar sands and extractive industries, um, there's usually a, a more predominant male workforce and that's um, causing these man camps that are bringing in women indigenous women and they're being assaulted um, and oftentimes that that linkage is happening at these man camps um, with our, our missing and murdered indigenous women and so there's a lot of reasons why we need to phase out fossil fuels uh, but I think when I think about my ancestors and how they signed those treaties uh, with the Canadian government, there was a lot to consider. And if there's one thing that I can hope that go happens when we, we do sign this treaty, um, it's thinking about accountability and how can, you know, if this treaty is broken, how can we ensure accountability going forward? Because as Indigenous peoples, you know, we were experiencing broken treaties and what we originally signed for and what we had thought um, was a lot different than what's happening right now. And so uh, for us, the land wasn't something that we could sell because the land is part of who we are. You know, in our creation stories, um, as our Anishinaabe creation story, we call our higher power uh, creator, Gajem Nado. And when he lowered us down as human beings, he told us that we had this role and this responsibility to be caretakers and maintain that balance here on Mother Earth. And when he lowered our bodies to the ground, our limbs, they fell across Turtle Island. And so that story, it tells us that we're a part of Mother Earth and that our ancestors are part of her. You know, we call our, our the rocks our grandfathers and um, those plants our grandmothers. And that's 
that's just a representation of how we need to look at nature and how we need to be in relation to her. And that what we do to Mother Earth, we're directly doing to ourselves and that harm that we're doing to ourselves. And so it's incredibly important that we move away and phase out from fossil fuels. We um, come together and sign these treaties that phase out fossil fuels. But at the same time, when we're thinking about that just transition and how the wealthiest countries, as in Canada, need to do this quickly, we need to think about the nations that are within this nation and how, you know, they don't even have access to clean water. So how are they supposed to, you know, start getting electric cars and um, putting up batteries? Those are all things to consider when we do negotiate these treaties. It needs to be looked at in a holistic way from a bird's eye view. And um, yeah, there's just, there's a, a, literally a lot to consider. However, I, I'm not in disagreement. I totally support this treaty. I just think, you know, when we do do this, it needs to be done in the right way and in a holistic way that um, encompasses a, a, a plethora of values. Um, and I think, I think that's pretty much it for me at the top of my head. I mean, I think one other thing I just wanted to mention too was recently I attended this beautiful retreat. It was a climate retreat for land defenders and water protectors. There's um, Indigenous folks that came from all parts of, of Canada. And there were these two women that um, were from the Wet'suwet'en pipeline. And... Um, you know, just hearing about their stories, it, it's, it was really impactful to listen to those women. And um, it was also a reminder of, you know, the resistance we've constantly done as Indigenous peoples and, and how we have to stay true to that. And there's so many different ways that we can do that. And for those women, they were, um, they were, they're living in a war zone, um, to be quite honest, like it, what they're facing the front lines is is so intense and I'm glad they got the opportunity to just step away from that for a few days because they're constantly on the front, the front lines experiencing what it's like um, to live in these war zones of extractive industries that are in your community in your backyard and it's really scary about the power of the amount of power that they hold um, within our country and when we move away from, you know, these extractive industries, we also also need to consider what, what we're moving towards and whether the where, where these extractive industries are moving their investments, because we are seeing, you know, that some of these industries are now moving their investments to electric cars. Um, and so we really need to consider, you know, um, who we're who we're giving our money to, who we're giving our resources to. Um, and just, again, as individuals, be really um, aware, be informed, be educated, uh, because we do need to move forward with things like these treaties. It's just one way that uh, we can come together and um, do better for our nations. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that there's little bits in there that... Um, that help and that support and I and again I think um, as individuals as communities we all have the power to see um, the change that we want and so we just really need to you know be informed and educate ourselves and um, be aligned with our values. Thank you so much, Tia. Um, I really appreciate you sharing so openly about um, impacts in your community and um, for bringing in that story of uh, the land defenders from Wet'suwet'en. Um, they certainly deserve retreat um, from time to time. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. And I think you touched on a really good point towards the end. Um, just that, you know, you have all these considerations or things that, that we should be considering in um, in the development of a treaty and in our endorsement of the treaty. And that's what we're hoping um, tonight can be is just having that open dialogue about it. Um, and knowing, you know, Kairos thinks that it's a good idea and we have endorsed, um, but we're here to um, open the conversation um, across Canada uh, to, to kind of work those things out. So I really appreciate you bringing that point up. 
Um, are there any questions for Tia um, before we we hear from Matt? I'll just maybe take a few. Uh, oh, actually, she uh, has a great question. In what ways, and maybe Tia, you want to just answer this, but I have a feeling your question, Carla, would be really great within the discussions to the small group discussion. But in what ways could we hold governments and industries accountable? Um, I'm assuming this is in connection if if they were um, in kind of contravention to the treaty, or maybe it's right now. Yeah. And, okay. So, Tia, yeah. I don't know if you have any ideas to that. Yeah. I mean, I don't necessarily have any ideas at the top of my head. I think it needs a lot of um, thought that is considered. But for myself, I would think, you know, because essentially these companies, um, you know, money is not a fine, isn't going to cut it for them. Like they can pay their way out of any fine um, that you imagine. And so I think accountability needs to go a step further and really consider, you know, jail time for desecrating Mother Earth, as we would assume that if someone's being assaulted, a person, that they would get, you know, jail time for assaulting a person. And so I think when we are negotiating these treaties and consider like accountability, whether it's jail time, um, you know, that's that's one way. Um, whether it's, you know, they're not so much paying a fine to government who is oftentimes then investing, continued investing into um, industry that they have to, uh, those fines are going to environmental networks or, you know, land defenders um, instead. Um, those are just some ideas, I guess. Thanks, Tia. Yeah, and maybe uh, folks, yeah, uh, yeah, Tia, uh, Carla has added boycott um, to the chat. So that's, uh, yeah, that's certainly something. And as you said, uh, you did kind of mention that um, a little bit is something that we can do uh, collectively. Um, thank you so much again. And uh, we'll keep the conversation going in the small groups, but I'm going to pass things over to Matt so we can hear from him. But um, before that, uh, that moment. Um, uh, so yeah, our third speaker tonight is uh, Matthew Van Abema, and Matthew is a third year student at Carleton University in the Faculty of Human Rights. He has previously attended the Dominican University College, where he earned a Bachelor of Theology and Philosophy. He has long cared about the environment and is just starting his journey into climate activism and his fight for human rights. Uh, Matthew is a member of Fridays for Future Ottawa and a part of the organizing team uh, making preparations for the global climate strike on Friday. And he just uh, informed me that he's also emceeing at the strike. So um, if you're in, in Ottawa and planning um, to be there, you will see him in person. Um, and thank you so much for being with us, Matt, and I'll pass it over to you. <clears throat> of course, thank you for the introduction. Also, I'd like to apologize. Uh, first off, that I've been kind of losing my voice this week uh, from doing so much speaking. So if you can't hear me, or pardon me a second. If you can't hear me, um, I can't really talk any louder than this. So if you could put your volume up, that'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, and secondly, I would like to thank the previous two speakers. And I hope I pay respect by speaking just as well if I can. Um, what I wanted to talk to you tonight about... Um, also, forgive me if you hear a cat crying in the background. It's dinner time and he's, he's angry, um, but I'll get to him afterward. Uh, what I want to talk to, to you tonight about was there's a, I feel like there's a rift, a distance between youth and uh, older generations that I hope to be a sort of ambassador to help cross or at least give some planks of wood in that bridge. Um, because when it comes, there's this thing that's been upsetting me. Uh, when it comes to older generations in my organization, because we're an intergenerational organization, uh, the older generations are always rallying about how, why aren't the youth more angry? Why aren't they more invested? Why aren't they more up in arms out in the streets? And the issue isn't that the youth are angry. And, you know, I'm speaking from an anecdotal general perspective, of course, <clears throat> beg pardon. But from my experience and from my perspective, wait, sorry, cat. Um, from my experience and perspective, it's not the youth aren't angry. It's not that we're not frustrated. It's not that we're ups not upset. It's just it all feels so overwhelming. And we all feel so alone in our struggle against climate change and in our climate activism. If I may, I'll share a story. Uh, I was speaking to my friend Sebastian 
we were having coffee and we got to talking about this, about me emceeing and organizing and rallying and being out there for the climate. And I asked him, well, why aren't you part of it? Because I'm, I'm a very blunt person, a very honest person. I don't like beating around the bush. Um, and he told me is that, well, it's not that I don't care. It's not that it doesn't affect me. It's not that I'm not upset by it. It's the fact that it just, it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a point. There doesn't seem to be any point in trying in going and doing. So if the people before me, you know, the older generations didn't do anything about it. And the people around me, you know, my generation aren't doing anything about it. Why should I? And his perspective was, yes, everything is going, you know, forget the language, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. But um, um, if I don't, no one's doing anything, I'll just do what everyone else is doing, which is enjoying my life. So he golfs and he goes to the movies and he just tries to distract himself as best he can from this climate fear, from this climate terror and anxiety. And that's another thing I want to talk about tonight were these two things. You know, in my generation, it seems to be <laughs> climate change seems to be destroying my generation, not only, you know, physically, you know, pollutants and toxins and cancer rates and all that sort of nonsense and absurdity that shouldn't be. Um, also mentally, spiritually, psychologically, is we are so devastated and dismayed and diminished and just feels like climate change is devouring every part of who we are that we we don't know what to do we don't know where to go and though we care it's not it's it's the frustration is paralyzing the fear is paralyzing the terror is paralyzing and it's not that i i understand that older generations also care it's not that at all i'm just as a youth i'm just trying to speak for the youth that's all i'm trying to do i'm not judging anyone but the two things i want to talk about tonight were hope and care because we don't see a lot of you know the idea of care in the climate change movement again uh for my the older generations that i interact i interact with not anyone else here personally but they talk about anger and you know, frustration and rallying and that's not who i am and that's not a lot of uh, how a lot of you see it we want to care not only about the environment but each other we want to care not only about affecting change but belonging to a community belonging to a group of people belonging to each other when it comes to fossil fuels, there is a great point in the proliferation treaty about a just transition, and a just transition does not, you know, mean a move away only from fossil fuels, but also a just transition for the workers, for their families, for their livelihoods, into renewable and into the renewable energy sector, into a less polluted earth, because humanity should shouldn't be at the fringes of the climate movement. It should be Earth and humanity, because we are as much a part of this planet as as this you know biosphere as everything else is and just because we're the ones that's messing everything up does not mean we are excluded from enjoying the benefit of a greener safer earth we should all enjoy that um and to speak of hope after speaking about so much dismay i know is a bit uh, paradoxical and ironic um <clears throat> but if i may you know indulge a little bit in my old philosophy background uh thomas aquinas uh, who is a? If you ever read Thomas Aquinas, I don't recommend. By the way, please don't ever read Thomas Aquinas. I'm sorry, there are Catholics here. I've read him thoroughly, and I never enjoyed him. But uh, it was a recommendation. It was a requirement. Sorry. He was, by all accounts, a very, you know, reserved, conservative, you know, personality-wise, not politics-wise, um, almost sour, cynical, dour man. And even he, when he talked about hope, even this this cynical man. Um, when he talked about hope, he has this gem in his writings that hope not only is, is you know, dignity personified, but is also dignifying. That when we hope, we all not only dignify ourselves, but when we hope, we dignify each other. And that idea of relation, again, is so important to the climate movement. It's important to not to realize that we're not alone, to realize that we all do care and we all want to hope. But we haven't made those threads. We haven't made those connections. We haven't built those communities. And we, when we see each other, you know, young, old, and we separate ourselves and we don't have a distance to cross. So my speaking here tonight, I want to propose a question to you. I'm sure if you have questions for me, I will take them. But I want to propose a question to you is how are you connecting to other people with your climate fears and climate terrors? Because it's not just about anger. It's not just about frustration. It's not just about, you know, hate against the fossil fuel companies, which is a valid feeling. I'm not trying to diminish or dismay anyone, you know, hate and anger and frustration. Those are all very valid feelings. 
I just also wanted to promote without diminishing the other feelings, promote the ideas of hope and care because we don't see that a lot in the climate activist movement and also promote the idea that we need to care about each other as much as we care about the world. And we need to hope together as much as we also have personal hopes. And we also need to start seeing each other less as those per those people over there, that thing over there, because this is all interconnected. You know, pollution doesn't care if it was it was produced on the other side of the globe or here. And it affects us all so deeply and so intimately that in order to fix everything, we need to start creating connection and creating relation and coming together. And we can only do that with, yes, in our shared anger, yes, in our shared sadness, yes, in our shared terror. But I believe you can also add to the roster hope and care because those are such deeply human feelings and sentiments and emotions. Thank you so much, Matt, um, for those powerful words. Um, I think you will find that many in this room are comfortable with the paradox um, between hope and despair. Um, so I think you're in good company in that way. And um, thank you for your your question to the group at the end. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to, to share anything or ask a question of Matt. Um, we'll just give a moment to the room to see if there's questions. Just uh, as I have Matt Penn, just uh, signal that you'd like to speak or, um, yeah, use the raise hand function. Uh, yeah, there's a nice comment here in the chat from Agnes. Matthew, to answer your question, I too am building bridges and asking Canadian Catholics in a virtual na national gathering on September 27th to endorse the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Uh, and Agnes is with the Lado to Sea movement in Canada. So there is some bridge building. Um, thanks for sharing that, Agnes. Okay, if there if there is no immediate questions of Matt, and again, uh, Matt and Tia are here um, for the rest of the the program until eight thirty. Um, uh, Claudia is just about to to head out, so thank you so much, Claudia, again for your presence. Um, but we wanted to go into oh, uh, Cheryl has a question. Go ahead, Cheryl. Yes, hi, and and uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Matthew, for. Um, for your feedback on that. I mean, I know myself and I know so many here on the call as well have been working on the climate crisis for many years, decades even. I know almost 10 years ago, I was in New York City where 400,000 people took to the streets and that was in the city alone. And millions of people worldwide took place, it took part as well. There are so many organizations that have been growing and building, you know, uh, there's Kairos, there's 350.org, there's the Citizens Climate Lobby, there's so many organizations that are out there working with volunteers. And I'm just wondering, you know, how can we capture the people? People are becoming very concerned right now, right? They're waking up, which is great, but they feel very alone. How do you reach out and connect to these people and let them know that you're not alone, actually. There are so many organizations out there that are doing stuff, even, even if it's whatever speaks to you. So I'm just wondering, because there seems to be this sense of, you know, we're all in our little silos, and that's actually not true. There's just been so much work that has been done for so many years. Um, and I'm just wondering, how do we connect people who are finding themselves in, in, in great fear? around this issue, feel paralyzed, um, uh, and how do we engage with those people so that, because we always believe, I mean, we've been saying this for decades, that action is the antidote to despair. So I'm just wondering, how can we connect people uh, and let them know that there's just so much out there that they can, that, that, that this has been going on for years? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I also hope I didn't offend anyone. I didn't mean to say that nothing's been done. <laughs> I hope that's never that didn't come across that way. Um, speaking of fear, I think that is how you connect to someone is through the fear. We have this tendency in this in our society to not speak of fear, to make it hush, to make it go away. But it's such a powerful emotion, such an again intimate, intimate emotion. Why should we not connect with it? Why shouldn't we say I'm afraid, just like you are afraid, or at least I'm afraid for different reasons, and you're afraid for these reasons? Why should we connect with you know connect by that way? There's also the idea where we shouldn't connect in each other's sadness, which is wrong. 
the, you know, the reason why we cry, you know, physically cry is to show other people and get their empathy and get their sympathy. And we connect in that way. This, we shouldn't diminish happiness. We shouldn't diminish joy. But again, it's just make this space for these, you know, negative emotions. They're not negative. They're real. They're actual. They're there. And if we try pushing them aside or pushing them away, we do no one any favor, especially ourselves. And if you want to connect to people, you have to connect with them where they are and what they're feeling. And if that's sadness, and if that's anger, and if that's frustration, and if that's, you know, even hate for something, connect to them on some level. Don't be hateful. I don't think you should be hateful, you know. That's a whole different conversation. But if you are sad, if you are afraid, if you feel terror, if you feel anxiety or guilt, connect on those feelings, share those feelings, build communities on those bonds. And that's, you know, my answer, my very limited experience. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And thank you, Cheryl, for that question. Um, I think it uh, really does kind of crack open a new um, way of, 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 of building um, the movement, right? This is this is where we are at, is meeting people where they are. Um, and sometimes we find ourselves in rooms and spaces where um, maybe everyone's kind of feeling that they've already reached the point of taking action um, and that there's still so many that um, are having these feelings and we wanna be present with them too. So um, thank you both for, for sharing that. Um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go into uh, to small groups now, um, just for maybe about ten minutes, um, uh, and and have um, just some conversation. Um, feel free to raise your own questions. I know some have already been raised in the chat, um, but uh, I will pop a few into the chat um, here as well for you to take note. Um, really, what I am hoping in this small group discussion is that um, you can uh, just either answer questions to the group to see um, maybe it's about the treaty, about the process of the treaty, or just about building momentum, how, you know, across Canada, we can build this momentum, um, calling for fossil fuel phase out, um, whether that's through endorsement of the treaty or other um, policies. Uh, so really just looking for folks to strategize and, and chat. Um, I have a few questions that I'll just say aloud and then share them in the chat. Um, but, you know, what would a fair phase out of fossil fuels look like in your community or region? Um, has your municipality uh, endorsed the treaty? If not, um, uh, you know, what opportunities and challenges uh, might you face in presenting a motion to seek endorsement? So um, where, wherever you are in Canada, like what, what would be the challenge there? Um, uh, and what unique challenges maybe face endorsement of the treaty uh, in Canada? Um, and how might churches and people of faith, um, as those kind of gathered here in this space, help to build momentum in support of, uh, of endorsement or in support of um, just other fossil fuel phase out legislation. So um, I will share those in the chat and then uh, just take a moment to open the rooms. And um, yeah, if you if you need to leave, that's fine. And if our rooms get a little too small, we can we can gather back um, into a bigger room. But um, I'll just share those questions now. And I'm just pulling them. And again, I've seen some really great questions posed in the chat. So please feel free to uh, choose your own adventure um, in, uh, in there. There we go. All right, so I'll open up the rooms now and we'll, we'll come back together in about 10 minutes. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for sticking with us and for for um, for joining others in in conversation uh, in those groups. Um, Carla just shared a little bit about what she was chatting about in her group. I wonder if anyone else wanted to uh, share insights about uh, about their conversations. Well, I, I was uh, raising the. Uh, question as to whether there are examples uh, to hand of uh, resolutions that have been put before municipalities or state legislative uh, bodies um, asking for endorsement of this uh, initiative. I'm aware that we're, not, we're talking about a bringing a treaty into being rather than signing on to a, a full treaty uh, with all its comprehensive kind of aspects 
So I'm just wondering whether there are ex examples of those kinds of resolutions. I, I would very much like to see it. I, I, I think it's a different matter asking people to sign on to the development of a treaty rather than asking them to sign on to a treaty itself. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Mervyn. A great, uh, it is a, an important distinction um, in this effort. And uh, I will be sharing some resources um, from the treaty initiative uh, um, to that to that end. Um, uh, so they, they have a whole kind of guide uh, for meeting with your representative, um, but I can also share out um, maybe some specific motions, uh, example motions. I know I do have one from um, the Anglican Consultative Council, um, but uh, maybe you can share out some others. Um, so thank you for that. Um, any other other questions or points to the group? Uh, my hand up. So oh, I sorry, Alan. I couldn't. I couldn't see it. I think it was it was <laughs> camouflaged in your background. My... So I better say something if I had my hand. Go up, ahead, but... Alan. Uh, yeah, in our small group, of course, we didn't have a, enough time, and that's always the way it goes, I guess. But uh, I guess uh, one of my concerns is that uh, uh, we should recognize that uh, the whole effort about uh, energy uh, and how it's produced is, really revolves around money. And if money is to be made out of oil and, uh, and, uh, and such uh, sources, of course, people are going to pursue it and companies are going to pursue it. So I, I think that we should try to emphasize more strongly that uh, governments give incentive to green energy projects so that they very quickly become more economical than the fossil fuel energies. And then people would switch over because uh, uh, simply the human greed for profit and the uh, and making money is always going to rule generally in society. And I, I guess I've been very concerned about what's been happening in Alberta. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the government has called for, a set, was it a seven-month halt on encouragement for green energy? I thought that was just plain ridiculous because yeah. apparently there's some, been some very successful green energy projects. And I have a feeling the government is really trying to uh, save the oil and gas industry a little bit because Absolutely. green energy is course, growing too fast. Of course. Yeah, I think we should uh, hound yeah. our politicians about that sort of thing and encourage the development very quickly of green energy. And it's certainly possible. Mm -hmm. Information from the group here um, uh, that came up in our group as well. Uh, money really speaks. And so, uh, yeah, thank you for that. I think. Um, we can we can champion things. The cost of renewables is uh, already more affordable, so <laughs> um, we just have to transfer that that affordability to uh, to uh, consumers. Um, so, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, okay, we are almost at the end of our time together, so I just wanted to share a few um, resources and uh, and announcements with you. I just put in the chat the link to endorse the treaty initiative, um, not the it, treaty itself, it's just the initiative to build a treaty um, in the chat. So please do that if you haven't already done so, and please share that around with uh, friends and family and colleagues. Um, I'm sharing a whole whack links just now in the chat, and I hope they are somewhat distinguishable. Um, these are just some of the campaign materials available from the Treaty Network um, to help you in your own efforts to uh, seek support or seek endorsement um, of, of the treaty. Please go onto that page though and, and explore. There's other things there, but I just pulled out a few that I thought were helpful. Um, and again, to Mervyn's point, um, I will try to find uh, some of these, uh, some of the motions, perhaps. And Jen, we, um, c'est possible qu'il y a des ressources en français sur le site. Um, I can share those out maybe with, uh, with the uh, follow-up email, but thank you for raising that. Um, there should be, there should be resources in French. Um, uh, a few other announcements just to make uh, is that, uh, as you know, this is, we are right in the middle of Climate Action Week. And um, it continues tomorrow with more content um, on the Kairos website and the Kairos blog. So look for that. Um, we'll be doing kind of uh, an overview of the global climate strike and uh, campaign to end fossil fuels um, uh, tomorrow on the blog with uh, just kind of unpacking the demands from uh, this year's climate strike. So look for that. 
Um, there will also be some resources there um, to support the strike um, virtually. So if you're not able to uh, participate in an action on Friday or Saturday or Sunday, um, maybe you can support it in other ways. Uh, Thursday, we're hosting another event at noon Eastern about the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And this will be more of a workshop discussion with the Reverend Canon Rachel Mash from Green Anglicans, um, uh, where she will share some of her insights of bringing forward a successful motion uh, to the Anglican Consultative Council earlier this year. So I will put that the registration for that um, in the chat now. And um, as you know, uh, there's more links um, on uh, the Climate Action um, Week webpage about the strikes and other things happening this weekend. So please do um, uh, take a look at those. Uh, this year, um, uh, For the Love of Creation, Kairos is supporting For the Love of Creation, um, a campaign that they're doing to uh, um, a youth group has uh, a youth advisory team has uh, called on all people of faith to uh, fold up commitments and send it to decision makers uh, through um, for the climate strike. So they're asking folks to uh, write a letter to decision makers and to fold it into um, kind of an origami of an endangered animal. So this is a call from some youth um, uh, uh, in the for the love of creation network. Um, so if that speaks to you and you want to um, use your creativity um uh please uh look at this link that i will just share in the chat now um for more information about that and we encourage you all to participate and share that around um and get folding and um i think i will just end it there i just want to say thanks again to our speakers um and to all of you for gathering here today um and being with us for this conversation and if you have any ideas to keep the conversation going in your community or across canada if there's ways for kairos to support that um, please do reach out to me and uh, we will keep that going. So thank you so much for coming today.